continue on the release of the Yemeni journalist Abdullah Haidershaya. Prior to his arrest, he broke a number of important stories about al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and he did the last known interview with U.S. born cleric Anwar al Awlaki just before it was revealed he was on a CIA hit list. Shaya's work often appeared on Al Jazeera. His investigative reporting was used by international journalists. This is his friend, the dissident political cartoonist Kamal Sharaf. He was so interested in revealing the truth. To reveal the American exploitation of Al Qaeda to occupy some Islamic countries culturally and economically, what is Al Qaeda who supports it? Why is it in a war with America? These questions were raised by all. All of us wanted to know what is going on. We were only exposed to Western media and Arab media funded by the West, which depicts only one image of Al-Qaeda. We hadn't heard other viewpoints, but Abdullah brought a different viewpoint. On Wednesday, Amnesty International responded to Abdullah Haidershaya's release by calling on the Yemeni and U.S. governments to investigate whether he was arbitrarily imprisoned based on his work as a journalist, as well as an independent review of the 2009 attack he helped expose. For more, we're joined by two people who've closely followed Shaya's case. Investigative reporter Jeremy Scahill, who is the producer and writer of the new film Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield, also author of the new book by the same title. He's the national security correspondent for The Nation magazine. We're also joined in Washington, D.C., by Rouge Awazir. She's a Yemeni-American activist who co-founded the Support Yemen Media Collective based in Sana'a, Yemen. She helped campaign for Abdullah Haidershaya's release and is currently working on a documentary on drone wars. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, Rouge Awazir, were you surprised by the news of Shaya's release this week? And can you talk talk about its significance. Most definitely. Um, we were expecting something to happen. Uh, President Hadi had come out in um May, and he had a meeting with U.N. representatives and told um, and told them that uh, he promises that Shaya will be uh, coming out uh, sometime before Ramadan, which is sometime uh, before July. Um, but speaking to many of the lawyers that have been working on the case, um, they've kind of—we've um, heard the rhetoric many, many times before, and uh, and President Hadi hasn't really followed up on the timeline that he, uh, he usually says. So, um, so when we heard the news um, two days ago, it was a great surprise to many of us, and it was a great, exciting surprise. Well, let's talk about the White House's response um, to the release of Shia. Uh, Jeremy Scahill contacted the National Security Council for a response. This is what the National Security Council spokesperson Bernadette Meehan wrote. She wrote, quote, "...we're concerned and disappointed by the early release of Abdul Shia, who was sentenced by a Yemeni court to five years in prison for his involvement with al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. The German Skate Hill, talk about what they have said. First of all, we, we, should, <clears throat> we should let that statement set in. The, the White House is saying that they are disappointed and concerned that a Yemeni journalist has been released from a Yemeni prison. The, the White House is citing uh, his conviction um, that he supposedly was a supporter of al-Qaeda in a kangaroo court, a court that was condemned by every major international media freedom organization, every major international human rights organization. There, it was a total sham trial, where he was kept in a cage during the course of his prosecution and was uh, convicted on trumped-up charges. So Mr. Constitutional Law Professor President is saying that this Yemeni court that has been condemned by every international human rights organization in the world is somehow legitimate. Secondly, when I've asked the White House and the State Department for a shred of evidence that Abdullah Haider Shia was guilty of anything other than journalism, uh, critical journalism, they won't provide it. They, they just say what they often do, state secrets, trust us. Uh, the fact is, Abdullah Haider Shia is a journalist who did very critical interviews with people like Anwar al -Laki. If you go back and you read his interviews with al he's challenging him on his praise of the underwear bomb attempt, saying, but that was a plane full of civilians. How is that a legitimate target? In fact, I would, I would put forward that Abdullah Haider Shia asked more critical questions 
of figures within the al-Qaeda organization in Yemen than a single member of the Caviar Correspondents Association in the United States, those jokers who sit in the front row and pretend to play journalists on television. This was a man who was put in prison because he had the audacity to expose a U.S. cruise missile attack that killed three dozen women and children, and the United States had tried to cover it up. They had the Yemeni government take responsibility for the strikes. The U.S. role was not initially owned. They said that they, they had uh, blown up an al-Qaeda training camp. The reality was women and children were killed. And why do we know that? We know it for two reasons. One is because Abdullah al-Hadr Shia went to the scene. He took photographs of what were clearly U.S. cruise missile parts uh, with General Dynamics uh, on them, made in the United States on them, uh, and because of the WikiLeaks cables showing that General David Petraeus, who at the time was the CENTCOM commander, conspired with the Yemeni dictator, Ali Abdullah Saleh, for the United States to begin bombing Yemen in the form of drones and cruise mi drone strikes and cruise missile strikes, and to have the Yemeni government publicly take responsibility for it. So when Abdullah al-Haider Shia exposed this, uh, and, and it became clear to the world that the Obama administration was starting to bomb Yemen, he was abducted by Yemen's U.S.-backed political security forces. He was taken to a jail and beaten and told that if he continued to report on the U.S. bombing campaign in Yemen, that he would be put back in jail. He went straight from his beating onto the airwaves of Al Jazeera and said, I was just abducted uh, by Yemen's security forces, and they threatened me. And then some months later, his house was raided in a night raid, and he was snatched and disappeared for 30 days. He was then brought into a court that was set up specifically to prosecute journalists who had committed crimes against the U.S.-backed dictatorship and was sentenced to five years in that court. So my question for the White House would be, you want to co-sign a, a dictator's arrest of a journalist, beating of a journalist, and conviction in a court that every human rights organization in the world has said was a sham court. That's the side that the White House is on right now, not on the side of press freedom around the world. They're on the side of locking up journalists who have the audacity to actually be journalists. I want to go to a clip from your film, Jeremy, Dirty Wars, uh, where you go to Al Majla to speak with residents and survivors of the U.S. cruise missile attack in 2009. People saw the smoke and felt the earth shake. They had never seen anything like it. I ran to the area. I found scattered bodies. And injured women and children. Forty-six people were killed, including five pregnant women. If they kill innocent children and call them Al-Qaeda, then we are all Al-Qaeda. If children are terrorists, then we are all terrorists. At 6 a.m., they were sleeping, and I was making bread. When the missiles exploded, I lost consciousness. I didn't know what happened to my children, my daughter, my husband. They all died. Only I survived, along with this old man and my daughter. Missiles attacked me and my brother Ibrahim and my mother. Their hands were cut. The echoes of Gardez were everywhere. So many of the details repeating themselves. But there was one important difference. In Gardez, the American soldiers went to obscene lengths to cover up the killings. Here in El Majula, despite the official denial, they'd left their fingerprints strewn across the desert. Why would they deny something so obvious when anyone who visited the bomb site would see the truth? But maybe that was the point. There was no declared war in Yemen. Out here, in the middle of the desert, no one was looking. 
an excerpt from Jeremy Scahill's Dirty Wars. Jeremy, you were at Al Majla. And the, in fact, the, the, what I say right after that is that the one local journalist who had investigated the reporting, had, uh, uh, the the, uh, the bombing, had disappeared. Um, you know, I mean, what, you know, what what. What I felt there when I was talking to those survivors is that the, the only Americans they will ever meet uh, are cruise missiles that took their, the lives of their family members. And, um, you know, being there with them and listening to this woman who had lost so many members of her family and this tribal leader, uh, you know, Mukbal, who, who was there, he, he was spared from that attack only because he was running an errand that day. And he returned back to find his village completely blown up. And, you know, I talked to tribal leaders who went there within 24 hours of the strike, and they described a scene where livestock and humans, uh, the flesh of livestock and humans was, was uh, melted together, and they couldn't determine if it was goats or sheep or human flesh, and, and they were trying to figure out how to even bury the dead. And, uh, you know, we have, we have video that's extremely graphic of uh, infants being pulled from rubble and, you know, children. I mean, 21 children were killed in that attack and 14 uh, women. And they, cl they claimed it was an al-Qaeda strike, but then when the Yemeni parliament went to investigate it, uh, they determined that that was a total lie. And, and why is it that the Obama administration has never had to publicly state why they killed 14 women and 21 children in the first strike that President Obama authorized? And, they, and you know, cruise missiles are a devastating weapon. Um, cluster bombs, which are banned internationally. The United States is one of the only nations on Earth that continues to use cluster bombs. These are like flying landmines that shred uh, people into ground meat. That's why the tribal leaders were saying we couldn't tell if it was the flesh of goats or sheep or humans. I mean, I've seen in Yugoslavia and elsewhere the aftermath of, of cluster bombs, but to use these on a Bedouin village, I mean, this, this White House should have to explain why that strike was in the interest of U.S. national security. You talked about the White House's response now that Shia should have had to serve out his full term. Um, also talk about President Obama's phone call to the dictator, Saleh. Yeah. In, well, what happened is that, you know, so Shia is convicted in this uh, kangaroo court, um, and, and then um, in February of 2011, uh, the, the Saba news agency, the official Yemen news agency, um, did a report saying that um, Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, the dictator of Yemen, was going to pardon Abdul Allah Haider Shia. You have to understand, at the time, there were posters put up all throughout the Yemeni capital demanding his freedom. There was huge tribal pressure. Uh, the human rights organization Hood, which was representing him, huge pressure. Rouge and other activists, other people in Yemen. There was massive pressure on that dictatorship to release him. Um, everyone knew it was a sham. And everyone in Yemen knows about the bombing of Al Majla. It, it is, you see postcards with it at demonstrations demanding accountability from the United States. And he's the guy who exposed it. So people knew who he was. So Ali Abdullah Saleh is in a position where it was becoming politically untenable to hold him in prison. He, uh, he says he's going to pardon him. The Yemeni news agency releases this. Uh, that day, he gets a phone call from the White House. This is like a year ago. Uh, this was in uh, February of 2011. He gets a phone call from the, uh, the White House, not from, you know, some undersecretary of who knows what, but from President Obama personally. And President Obama, according to the White House's own readout of that call, expressed his concern uh, about reports that they were going to release Abdul Allah Haider Shia. And just to give you a sense of what a client state Yemen was, the pardon then is ripped up. And he remained in prison then uh, over the course of the next two years. And in, in fact, the, the White House, President Hadi just left yesterday from Sana. He's visiting the United States right now. Supposedly it was for medical reasons, um, but he's now going to meet with President Obama. And, and I, th I think it's going to be very interesting to see what comes out of that. The White House is clearly very, very irked that, that Hadi uh, released Abdullah Haider Shia. Um, I wanted to go to the lawyer for one minute, um, to Abdullah Haider Shia's lawyer, Abdurrahman Barman, who describes how Shia was beaten and psychologically tortured by Yemeni security forces. Uh, Abdul Ella Haider received many threats from the security forces over the phone, and when he was kidnapped for the first time, they beat him and interrogated him concerning his statements and the analysis on the Al Mujalla issue and the U.S. war against terrorism here in Yemen. 
تم ضربه يعني ضرب مبرح على الرغم انه لم يقاوم طلب I think he was arrested based on a request from the American government at the time of his arrest they beat him even though he did not resist them he was asked by soldiers to come and he went with them they took him from his house and when they were in his yard the soldiers beat him cruelly using the butts of their guns and one of them bit him in the chest and the scar was still there when we met him in prison he was not physically tortured but he was psychologically tortured he was put in a dirty bathroom for five days he was told that all of his friends and family members had left him that he was alone and that no one supported his case he was tortured by false information in the first session of the prosecution I noticed that one of Abdul Allah's teeth was extracted and that another one was broken in addition to some scars on his chest that was after 25 days of detention there were a lot of scars on his chest we have noted that in the general prosecution minutes and we requested a referral to a forensic doctor to prove the torture on his body he was referred but we have not received a copy of the doctor's report and we have not been allowed to make a copy for his case file so far that was Shaya's attorney, Abdurrahman uh, Barman, Rouge Awazir. Uh, you just spoke with Barman. Uh, can you talk about the conditions of Shaya's release this week? Sure. Um, so right now, his health is um, deteriorating. He's, he's lost a massive amount of weight, um, but he's in a better uh, position. He's with his family. He finally enjoyed his first um, iftar with his family and his kids. Um, he's hopeful that um, justice will still prevail, because, as he said, as soon as he uh, was released, he said um, in a statement to his lawyers, uh, Although I am released, I am still not a free man. In the eyes of the political and national security, I am still a threat, and therefore I am not free. Um, he is—he uh, has—he's under two years of house arrest, and after that, three years of a travel ban. Um, not able to really—he still has no—he's um, still not able to speak. He's still not able to write. He's not allowed to go anywhere without having security around him uh, at all times. Um, and this is all on the concept of, of him still—of um, of, of him still being— um, linked to al-Qaeda with no evidence be being supported or, or presented against him. So there's still this idea that he is, um, you know, quote-unquote, aiding the enemy or part of uh, al-Qaeda with no, uh, no evidence against him. Um, so although he's part of—he's um, out of jail, he still f feels that he's imprisoned inside. Finally, Jeremy. So I think— Go ahead, Rouge. So I just think that's that's really important. Although this is a big victory um, that he has been released, I think that's something that we really need to be focusing on. That um, uh, although he, uh, that he's never been given a, um, a proper trial, that d due process was completely skipped, um, that it was completely a political um, decision uh, based on no uh, le with no legal basis, uh, only outside interference by the Obama administration. Jeremy, put um, Shia's treatment in the context of how reporters are being dealt with today. Yeah, I mean, look, look, at, look at this White House's position on whistleblowers and on journalists. You had the, uh, the seizure of the Associated Press phone records. Uh, you have record numbers of uh, prosecutions uh, and indictments under the Espionage Act. Um, you have what I, what I think amounts to a criminalization of independent reporting. This White House seems intent on having the only information that journalists have access to official leaks. Um, and when it is meant to make the, uh, the White House look noble and saving the world for peace, freedom, and democracy. And any independent reporting or talking to sources that are not official uh, is frowned upon and at times prosecuted. Uh, there was a recent court decision that I think is very disturbing. Uh, James Risen of The New York Times has been ordered to testify against a source of his, who was a whistleblower. Um, you have Bradley Manning's uh, trial coming to a conclusion. The charge against him of aiding the enemy boils down to an assertion that uh, anyone who provides information on the Internet that then can be read by a terrorist is somehow aiding the enemy. They're actually contending that Bradley Manning, in leaking the diplomatic cables, uh, aided Osama bin Laden directly, because Osama bin Laden was reported to have read some of the WikiLeaks cables. If that charge sticks, it should be chilling not just for journalists, uh, but for the public at large.
when, in the day of social media when everyone is a journalist of sorts. Um, so this uh, administration has been utterly shameful in its approach toward a free press, uh, toward whistleblowers, and it, it fundamentally undermines the notion that we have a free press in a democratic society. The fact that they had a Yemeni journalist jailed in a Yemeni court and kept him in prison there and are now deeply concerned uh, and, and upset that he's been released speaks volumes about this administration's attitude toward journalists. Jeremy, before you go, I just wanted to ask you about a very significant Senate hearing that was held yesterday addressing the closing of Guantanamo Bay prison for the first time since 2009, when Obama made his first and failed concerted push to shutter the prison. One of those who testified was Frank Gaffney of the Center for Security Policy, which opposes uh, closing Guantanamo. The topic of drones came up when he was questioned by Republican Senator Ted Cruz of Texas. It, it has been reported that, that President, under the Obama administration, uh, approximately 395 people have been killed by drone strikes. Um, are you aware of any, any reasonable argument that it is somehow more protective of human rights, more protective of civil liberties, to fire a missile at someone from a drone and kill them? than it would be to detain them and interrogate them, determine their guilt or innocence, and determine what intelligence might be derived from that individual. I'm probably not the best arbiter of what is humane. Uh, you have people on this panel who spent a lot of their time dwelling on that. I, I kind of focus on national security, but just as a human being, I will tell you, I think if you kill people, that typically is less humane than incarcerating them. And, and letting them, and letting them starve to death is, in my judgment, less humane than uh, feeding them involuntarily if necessary. That was Frank Gaffney, Center for Security Policy, testifying at the Guantanamo Bay prison hearing yesterday in the Senate. Jeremy Skeho. I mean, these, you know, Frank Gaffney is, is a notorious, discredited neocon. The fact that he was even testifying, uh, you know, talks about the seriousness of that hearing. But uh, let's be clear here. The Republicans during their administration, their sort of reign of terror, were murder incorporated, where torture was was the official policy. Uh, they, didn't even, they didn't even pretend to, to, to act like it was some abomination that happened once in a while. Uh, they they were killing people in massive numbers in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, all around the world. Uh, so the fact that these guys are now trying to say, well, you know, the Obama administration, because he dismantled the interrogation program, is somehow less humane than we were, uh, is, is just a sick joke. I mean, the fact is that, bo that Obama continued many of the worst policies on a counterterrorism level that were built up under the Bush and Cheney administration. And these Republicans, they, they, they would love to be doing exactly what Obama was doing. They're just attacking him because he's Obama. Um, but they, they love his, his you know, so-called national security policy. Um, at the end of the day, uh, th they're being motivated more by their own partisan agenda. And it's, it's an attempt to argue, and it's an insidious argument, that torture is, is actually a policy that the United States should fully embrace once again. That's what they're trying to do here. Um, but they, they, they quietly love the Obama administration's uh, drone policy and counterterrorism policy. Uh, well, we are going to